Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, researchers have sequenced ancient proteins from more than 20 million years ago and have rewritten the rhinoceros evolutionary tree, three new species of dinosaur have been named, and much more. Our top story this week is the report that scientists have just sequenced the oldest ever prehistoric proteins that have allowed them to work out the evolutionary relationships of extinct animals. Understanding how ancient animals evolved and were related to modern species has largely involved examining the physical characteristics of their bones, particularly when dealing with animals that are millions of years old. Since genetic information that lasts for multiple millions of years is very difficult to recover intact. Currently, the oldest confirmed ancient DNA from animal remains dates to about 1.2 million years ago, obtained from exceptionally well-preserved Arctic mammoth specimens. However, utilising prehistoric proteins is a promising area of research, because these molecules are more resistant to degradation than DNA over time, meaning we can use them to look even deeper into the past. There have been some very contentious and debated reports about discovering fragments of proteins from dinosaurs that lived more than 66 million years ago. However, prior to this new study, the oldest undisputed record of prehistoric proteins was from a three and a half million year old camel relative found in the Canadian Arctic. Now though, a prehistoric rhino dating to between 21 and 24 million years old has yielded the oldest ever evolutionary informative protein sequences. These sequences were obtained from a specimen of Epiocerotherium and were extracted from the fossil's tooth enamel. The researchers then used the genetic information from these proteins to work out how Epiceriotherium was related to other extinct and modern rhinos, uncovering some surprising results. It appears this rhinoceros branched off earlier than any of the analysed rhino species, splitting from them sometime between 41 and 25 million years ago. It also shows that the famous so-called Siberian unicorn, Elasmotherium, is more closely related to modern rhinos than Epiocerotherium is to either lineage. The findings also suggest that, contrary to previous studies, there was not a deep divergence between the Elasmotherium lineage and the modern rhino lineage. Instead, they split from each other later than expected. According to the co-leader of the study, it really does change the way we have to think about the evolution of rhinos. It's a brilliant study that not only shakes up the rhino family tree, but also demonstrates that proteins retaining useful evolutionary information can indeed survive for more than 20 million years. So, is it just a matter of time before the evolutionary relationships of non-bird dinosaurs can be analysed genetically? Very exciting stuff. In other fantastic paleo news, this week also has been great for dinosaurs, as three new species have been named. First, we have a new type of dromaeosaur, commonly known as the raptors. It's a velociraptorine, meaning it's a close relative of the infamous velociraptor itself, but this new species is unique among this branch of dromaeosaurs for having an extremely robust hand, with proportionally thick finger bones and a rather enlarged claw for its size. It's been named as a new species of a genus that was already named back in 2021, Shri. Therefore, this new animal is known as Shri Rapax. The fossil material known for this species is beautifully complete. Well, almost. It's based on a practically complete and articulated skeleton, but although the figures in the paper show the head being attached, the skull is actually missing. Fortunately, preliminary digital scans and photos were taken of the skull before its loss. This fossil has a complicated ownership history and was illegally taken from Mongolia sometime before 2010, changing hands several times before eventually being returned to a Mongolian museum. At some point between 2016 and the time of this study, the skull disappeared, and its current whereabouts are unknown to the authors. Nevertheless, Sri Rapax is a very interesting specimen. It would have coexisted with Velociraptor about 75 to 71 million years ago, and it was about 2 metres long, or around 6.5 feet. 
The more robust arms and stockier hands of this species compared to Velociraptor suggest that Shri Rapax hunted different prey, possibly targeting larger ceratopsians and armoured ankylosaurs. Shri also has a shorter snout and may have had a stronger bite force than Velociraptor. So lots of fascinating implications for the evolution and niche partitioning of these raptors have been uncovered thanks to this stunning fossil. Up next we've got our second new dinosaur of the week. This is a particularly exciting new species as it's extremely gigantic. Measuring between 24.5 and 28 metres in total body length or about 80 to nearly 92 feet. This colossal new dinosaur is a member of the especially long-necked sauropod family Mamenchisauridae and was discovered in China. It lived about 145 million years ago during the later part of the Jurassic and it's been named Tongnanglong Jimingi. The giant dinosaur is known from fossils that include three backbones, six tail bones, parts of the shoulder and partial hind legs. The size of the shoulder girdle shows how enormous Tong Nang Long really was, as the scapula and coracoid bones together are more than a metre long. The paper also mentions, rather cautiously, that if the scapula of this new species is compared to that of a related species and scaled up, Tong Nang Long might have measured a whopping 33 metres in total length, or over 108 feet. However, this other species is only known from an incomplete skeleton and so it can't be said for sure that it was really that huge. Nevertheless, this is an impressive discovery, adding another species to the roster of truly enormous sauropods and enriching the known diversity of the Mamenchisaurids. Our final new dinosaur species this week is a small herbivorous species known from a beautifully complete skeleton that even preserves the voice box of this animal. Arr. This is only the second known dinosaur to preserve bony parts of the voice box called the larynx after an ankylosaur described back in 2023. The new species has been named Pulaosaurus kinglong and it's a very early diverging neonothician dinosaur, meaning it's a basal member of the major lineage that includes ceratopsians, stegosaurs, ankylosaurs, hadrosaurs and many others. Pulaosaurus lived sometime between 165 and 155 million years ago during the middle to late Jurassic period and its position as one of the earliest branching neonothicians helps paleontologists understand more about the early evolution of this group. Thanks to the preservation of the laryngeal elements, they have learned that this dinosaur potentially could have produced bird-like vocalisations. The ankylosaur with a voice box has already been considered capable of making quite bird-like noises, but discovering that such a basal member of this major dinosaur lineage had a similar bird-like anatomy suggests this might have been a widespread ability. So it seems that perhaps all these different herbivorous dinosaurs could produce complex, explosive, avian-style calls. What an absolutely incredible discovery. In other news, we're going back to Mars. It's been a while by our standards, but we've got another story that looks to put in a word on the debate about what Mars was like about 3.7 billion years ago. There are two competing ideas. One is that Mars was a warm, wet planet with liquid water on the surface, and the other is that Mars was a much colder and drier place. This cold, dry idea may seemingly be easily refuted by clear geological evidence of flows on Mars, changing the surface geology in such a way that we can still see today. Champions of the cold, dry idea say that these features formed sporadically by slow melting ice sheets rather than warmer flows of water. A study published this week analysed surface geology of an underexplored region called Noachis Terra and found ridges across the surface with a total length of over 15,000 kilometres. It's believed that these ridges were formed when rivers deposited sediment which hardened and was eventually exposed when material around it was eroded away. This suggests that there was a significant amount of flowing water and supports the warm and wet model of Mars. Another exciting study that sheds further light on the increasingly interesting history of the Red Planet. And now a quick mention to the James Webb Space Telescope, which marks its third birthday this week. Well, one of its third birthdays. It was launched on the 25th of December 2021, arriving at its home in space at one of the Earth-Sun Lagrange points in January the following year. 
Its birthday has since been celebrated on the 12th of July when the first fully coloured images were released to the public and its science mission properly began. To celebrate the birthday this week, NASA released an image of the cat's paw nebula taken by the telescope, revealing what they have dubbed mini toe beans, where colossal young stars have carved out gas and dust shining their bright light back on our own planet. The James Webb Space Telescope truly is, as NASA puts it, the world's premier space science observatory. It's been a pleasure reporting on it for over three years on Seven Days of Science, as we saw its launch, arrival setup problems, initial images, and now the host of studies and discoveries that can come from this remarkable piece of equipment. Here's to many more years of brilliant astronomy. Finally for the news this week, it's been announced that in January 2026, Japan will start deep sea mining in its exclusive economic zone around a remote island. The aim is to extract 35 tonnes of mud from the seafloor over a period of three weeks. If successful, a system to recover 350 metric tonnes of mud per day could be running by January 2027. The controversy surrounding deep sea mining is significant. The scientific community and environmental campaigners warn that deep sea mining will destroy fragile marine ecosystems that we know little about. And we still don't fully understand the consequences of this. We do know that bottom-dwelling organisms will die. Sediment plumes will be produced, which will travel great distances, smothering marine life and disrupting food chains. There will also be considerable noise pollution, which will hinder the communication, navigation and feeding of whales and light pollution will impact sensitive organisms. Scientists warn that far more research needs to be done before we embark upon deep sea mining and destroy yet again one of our planet's key ecosystems. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at sevendos.stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. You can also follow me personally on Instagram and TikTok as Miss Amelia Evans. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Sang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Batha, Deanna Hernandez, Drav Strivestaba, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, G-Artist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Pirepazika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Potricus, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy and Tedro, and Troy Schmidt. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next week.